Greetings, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the season after Epiphany. Uh, this first week after Epiphany always celebrates the baptism of our Lord. Uh, and we'll look at the story of the baptism of our Lord in Matthew 3 uh, and hear the Father say, out of heaven, this is my own dear son. Um, and that'll be our theme for this teaching, my own dear son. The season after Epiphany focuses on the manifestation of Christ. It focuses on Christ revealed as the Messiah uh, gradually through the early part of his life, but really starting with the uh, arrival of the Magi. He is revealed to the world as the Savior. Uh, and so we've emphasized the song, We Three Kings. These three wise men came um, and they, they really represent in some way the whole world. They, they represent uh, the rest of the world acknowledging uh, that this Savior belongs to all of us. Um, and so as we look at this theme of my own dear son, uh, it, it really is the beginning of Christ uh, being publicly, clearly uh, shown to be God's Messiah. Uh, this is a very public scene that we'll see. Uh, it's at the Jordan River. John has been gathering a bunch of people to him. Um, and there is a voice that speaks out of heaven. A dove descends on Jesus. It's all very, it's all very public. Um, and so he is manifested as God's son. Um, and this is, again, this is all part of this bigger story uh, that the Bible tells. A story of the father who sent his son into the world to save a people for himself and sent his spirit to seal us and preserve us until uh, he comes again. Um, the story told in the word of truth. And we respond to this. We have a part to play. We confess the truth of this. We worship. We live in the way we serve. Um, and represent Christ in the world. So um, we're going to focus on this theme of my own dear son in Matthew 3, and I'll exegete that scripture some. We'll explore that theme in scripture, and then we'll experience the theme's takeaways. So there's a great picture, as I said, of the, the very public event that we're going to read about, that uh, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River by uh, John, the prophet John, his cousin. Matthew 3.13 says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. Um, and so it's important when Matthew, he starts here with then, um, it, he's actually connecting what he says here to what just came right before. And what happens right before is John is preaching and teaching um, and the Pharisees come and ask him what he's doing um, and ask him who he is. And so he gives this whole uh, thing about who he is. Um, and verse 11 is particularly important. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And the, ver and the verse, and then, then Jesus came from Galilee. It's sort of like in a movie where, like a mystery movie or something, where there's a, you know, somebody's trying to solve it and they're like, I think I know who did it. And then the scene immediately cuts to another character. That's sort of what happens here. <laughs> John is, I, one is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Then Jesus came. And it's, it's uh, meant to seem together for you, to show you uh, that this is who John is talking about. So John, actually, when Jesus comes to be baptized in verse 14, John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? So John understood. John uh, had been told by God and uh, was a prophet of the Lord, and he knew who was coming after him. He knew that the one coming after him was greater than him. Um, he was clear about that. And so he um, was sort of taken aback by Jesus, wanting to be baptized by him. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. But, but John, I mean, John, his whole life, every story you read about John in the Bible, um, it really uh, is about him understanding his place as a prophet and pointing toward the coming Messiah, announcing the coming Messiah. Now, Jesus's response, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness, is uh, the subject of incredible debate uh, and Really, since the church started, you can look back all the way to the 100s when the church first started using the Gospel of Matthew, people have been puzzling over exactly what Jesus meant by this. 
Um, and there's, there's all kinds of uh, ideas and opinions, but what it seems to come down to, um, if, if we sort of boil it down, is, is he, he means something about his identification uh, with, with humanity, with the people of God. Uh, Paul in Ephesians says that God sent Christ uh, to unite all things in him. It's like he, he's summing everything up, or as one theologian put it, recapitulating, recapping everything, summing it all up in him. Um, and so fulfilling all righteousness seems to have something to do with identification. Uh, he identifies clearly with the Old Testament pattern for Messiah. Um, he is identifying with Israel in this. This is, uh, in fact, parallel to the Exodus. It's parallel to what happened in Israel when they came through the waters and also when they passed through the Jordan into the Promised Land. Uh, the pattern for Messiah um, is Israel's own history. Um, and so he is identified with um, Israel, identified with the Old Testament pattern for Messiah, this promised one who would come. He's also identified then, uh, we see very clearly, as the New Testament pattern for the church. Uh, Christianity is uh, modeled specifically, explicitly after Jesus, right? We, we follow the pattern of Jesus. And so Christian baptism, something that we see from the very first day, from the day of Pentecost where uh, Peter preaches and thousands are saved, from the very first, that's the birth of the church, uh, they're, they're baptized. Uh, he tells them to be baptized uh, and repent and be baptized and that they would uh, be saved. And so Jesus's identification here is, is at least uh, something important about what he means. Thus, it is fitting for him to fulfill all righteousness. He is um, uniting all things in himself, identifying with the people of God across all ages, um, and in some sense, becoming um, the pattern for all of us. Uh, the pattern, fulfilling the pattern from before, becoming the pattern for the church, uh, being in some sense the ultimate human being, the ultimate image of God, the ultimate one who fulfills our purpose. And then we are identified in him. Uh, Paul very clearly, when we are baptized, says that we're baptized into his death, we're baptized into his burial, his resurrection, and we are in him. Um, and this is important, uh, that we are identified with him, uh, becomes a, a central I mean, it becomes a central issue in baptism. I mean, it becomes central when we look back uh, from a Christian perspective on Jesus' baptism. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But, but Jesus, uh, in continuing the story in Matthew 3.16, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, my own dear son. This is the one who I have sent, my beloved son. Um, God is claiming Christ as his own, claiming Jesus um, and anointing him with the spirit and saying, this is the one that I have sent. This is, this is my king. This, I, this is the one that I have sent forward to fulfill all that I promised. Um, and I am, I am pleased with him. Uh, again, it's just a, such a dramatic moment, right? There's very few instances actually in all of the scripture where you explicitly see the entire Trinity come on stage um, in a story. And this is one of those instances where you, you really, you see the Father speak out of heaven, you see the Son baptized in the Jordan, you see the Spirit descend. Um, it's just a huge dramatic incident. Um, and, and it identifies Jesus um, as the Son of God, but as uh, one of us, as uh, the pattern for all of us as well. So if we could just sum this up, Jesus is the beloved Son of the Father with whom he is pleased and the one upon whom the Spirit rests. He is the one, right? He is the pattern. He is the explicit fulfillment of all of this. If we look at this theme in Scripture, they the Israelites always expected their king, the, the one sent from God, to be a beloved son. Uh, and so sonship in their uh, way of thinking, uh, according to these verses, is actually related to the king. It's related to God's king. Uh, Psalm 2 says, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. 
I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. So it's, it's related to his installation of his king. Um, he also then, um, that Israel expected the Messiah to be one in whom the Father delights, one who pleases the Lord, um, and not just in a passing way, uh, but one whose obedience, whose life, whose person delights the Lord. Uh, Psalm uh, Isaiah 42 says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. There will be no um, curse. There will be no... God in the Old Testament um, very often did not delight in his people. Um, And we see that across the pages. His response to them was not happiness. It was not delight. But this one to come, this Savior, he would be the one in whom God's soul delights. And you even see here, see here that he would also have the spirit upon him. He is the one upon whom the spirit rests. Um, And quoting Isaiah 61 in Luke 4, when Jesus uh, in his hometown of Nazareth uh, gets up and reads from the scriptures, he reads from Isaiah 61. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus claims to be then the one upon whom the Spirit has rested, the one, the beloved Son, upon whom uh, the Spirit is resting. So Jesus is the beloved Son of the Father with whom he is pleased and the one upon whom the Spirit rests. So I want you to take this away with you. You are beloved. You are anointed. You are beloved of the Father. You are anointed. So what I said earlier about identification Uh, Jesus identifying with us, and then in our baptism, us becoming identified with him. Um, What seems to happen in all of that is Christ's inheritance, God's delight in him, uh, Christ's own relationship with the Father. Um, We we sort of are grafted into that. We are in Christ, and in him, we are beloved. Friends, you are beloved of the Father. There is nothing you could ever do to change the love of the Father for you. You are beloved. Uh, out, of, out of heaven he spoke. Uh, he said, this is my son. I love him. I am delighted in him. Um, the only way that we could become not beloved is if Christ became not beloved of the Father. If, if that happened, then, then we would no longer be the beloved of the Father. But as long as we are in Christ and Christ is beloved of the Father, you and I, brothers and sisters, are beloved. That's a great picture from the story of the prodigal son who went away and sinned and did all kinds of crazy stuff. And his father, when he came home, welcomed him and loved him. It's just this incredible tenderness. I just, I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, that no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done in Christ, you are beloved. You are the beloved of the Father, and you are anointed. The Spirit rests upon us. Um, Christ had the Spirit come down out of heaven, and in the same way on on Pentecost, the Spirit comes down like tongues of fire. Um, And and the Bible assures us, brothers and sisters, that if we are in Christ, God has uh, sent his Spirit to rest upon us. We are anointed by the Spirit. Uh, We are anointed for service to God. This picture of Samuel anointing David for kingship. Um, God anointed Christ as his king, and he has given us his spirit uh, to be part of his kingdom. We are anointed. Uh, in, In Christ, the Holy Spirit has come to be with us. We are empowered. We have purpose. We have a reason. We have what we need to do what God is asking us to do. Brothers and sisters, you you are anointed by the Father. You are, the Holy Spirit rests upon you to lead you, to guide you, to comfort you, to teach you. We are anointed. So as we look at this story, we look at the story of Jesus' baptism where uh, the Father says he is his own dear son. I I want you to understand that in Christ, you are beloved and you are anointed.